cloud. Okay, we should be recording now. So for today, we're gonna work on starting chapter three. Um, chapter three is about graphing polynomial and rational functions. So polynomial functions being things that look of this sort, okay? So you'll have some coefficient and then x to some power plus another coefficient with x to a lower power. And the power should always decrease as you keep going until eventually you get down to just a coefficient times x squared plus a coefficient times x plus just a constant without a variable, okay? Um, those are generally what we how we define polynomial functions. So it's just, you know, a coefficient x and then some power and a bunch of those terms, okay? Uh, if you can combine like terms, you usually do. And so it's always in its what, what is called descending order, okay? Um, now, the thing is that in the beginning of chapter three, we're going to concentrate a lot on these polynomials. And then eventually we'll start talking about rational functions. And rational is just a fancy word for fraction, okay? So not only will we eventually learn a lot of information about polynomials so that we can graph them, we'll also eventually in the last, last section, um, apply all that we learned about polynomials and extend it with a couple of more facts to be able to graph rational functions, which are fraction uh, functions, okay? So at the beginning, we're gonna basically define what a polynomial is, talk about the different types and all of that good stuff, come up with some of the vocabulary words like polynomial function, leading coefficient, or dominating term. I don't even think I've ever used that word, but anyway. Um, zero polynomial, quadratic function, parabola. Some of these words we've already used before. I know you've heard me say this, but now is the section where we actually talk more about it. Um, and then we're not really gonna cover this. So I don't think we're gonna cover these two things, but we'll see as we go, okay? Um, the first type of polynomial equation is just a constant, okay? And when you have just a constant, all you have is the literally just the constant term. So an example of that is like this one here in the first uh, box. When you just have your function equal to some number with no letters whatsoever, okay? So in that case, those are called a constant function. I'm just gonna write the word constant. I don't write function for each one, okay? So this one's called the constant function. And since there's no x's, here's a new word, this word right here, degree, okay? Degree, they don't even define it, that's weird. Okay, anyway, degree is the highest exponent, okay? So a polynomial has a bunch of terms usually, right? or it could just have one term, but it could have multiple terms. And you're just looking at the exponent that's the highest, okay? But here, this is a constant. And a constant doesn't have an x, so it doesn't have an exponent. Notice all the exponents are on the x's, right? And there's no x here. So what you need to start looking at this is like if it were x two times one, that's the same as two, right? And then if you wrote one in an even weirder way, you could write that as x to the power zero, okay? Because anything to the power zero equals one. You could try it out in your calculator. Five to the power zero is one. Negative two thirds to the power zero is one. So it doesn't matter what x is, no matter what it is, if I raise it to the power zero, it is the same thing as one, okay? So when you see a number by itself, you know how when you see X by itself, there's some invisible things happening, right? There's an invisible one coefficient and there's an invisible one exponent. Well, it's the same thing with constants. There's a whole invisible variable that you don't really see, okay? Um, but if I look at that, and since that's the only term I have is two, and if I make the invisible visible, my variable here with that two actually does have an exponent and its exponent is zero. So the degree of a constant function is just going to be zero, 
This one's a little bit weird. The rest of them are not so weird, <laughs> but that one is definitely weird, okay? Now, when you talk about leading coefficient, this is the number in front of the term with the highest exponent. Okay, now I only had one term in this function, right? And when we made the invisible visible, it's still the only one term I have, two x to the zero, it's just one term. So the coefficient in front of that x is two. So the leading coefficient here would be two. Again, this is the only weird one. The other ones are not as bad. <laughs> Now, the other kind of functions that we've seen before are linear functions, right? When it looks like this, if it said y equals or anything like that, that's a linear expression. So these ones are called linear functions. And in a linear function, the highest exponent is the invisible one. Remember, this guy's like an invisible x to the zero, right? So between x to the one and x to the zero, the guy with the highest exponent is x to the one. And that highest exponent is one. So degree is the highest exponent. Leading coefficient is the number in front of the term with the highest exponent. So I have two terms here. This is the one with the higher exponent and the number in the front is five. So my leading coefficient is five there. Now the next one, this one has, you cannot tell, but it's a two. I'm just gonna make it real big, but that's an X squared, okay? And we know when we see X by itself, it's like one power, right? And we know that when we see a constant now, you have an invisible X to the zero there. So when I look at all of those, this highest exponent is going to be two. And the number in front of that guy with the highest exponent is four. And what kind of function is this? Whenever you have x squared as the highest, it's called quadratic. And that's what we're gonna concentrate on in this section. Okay, this section's all about quadratic functions. Models means there's word problems, okay? So we'll have word problems. But we'll learn the basics first and then we'll look at the word problems. So the next one, again, this is not real obvious, but this is a cube, it's a three. It's just real tiny. And then this, we know this invisible one, and we know that a constant has an invisible x to the zero. So between the exponents three, one, and zero, the highest is three. And whenever you have x to the third power, it's always called a cubic function. And leading coefficient, right, is the number in front of the term with the highest exponent. So this was the term with the highest exponent. The number in front is a two. Now, I don't know if you could tell, um, I, I can write it again. This is a four, this is a three, and then this exponent is a two. So I'm just trying to make them bigger so you could see them. Now notice that this little house stops after the two. So that little house is not over the X, okay? Because if it were, it would mean something completely different and it actually wouldn't be a function at all. We'll probably address that at some point, but not right now, okay? But it, the little house is not over the X. So it's just like the number in front of X cubed is square root of two. But if we look at all of these, the highest, exponent here is the fourth power and the number in front of him is actually an invisible one so the leading coefficient is a one and what do we call things with a exponent of four it's almost like quadratic it's like i i would get them confused <laughs> but it's quartic okay 
So it's not quadratic, it's just quartic. I don't know why they use quad at all for two, but they do. So that leads us into just recognizing the degree, recognizing the leading coefficients, and then recognizing the types of functions they are, okay? And the one that we're gonna concentrate on in this section is the quadratic equations. And so we know with the quadratic equations, you always have ax squared plus bx plus c. As long as the function has the highest exponent of two, then you are talking about a quadratic function, okay? Now notice here that it says that a cannot equal zero because if it's zero, this guy's missing. And if he's missing, that's not a quadratic anymore. That's a linear, right? But this guy could be missing and it's still considered a quadratic because you still have x squared. This guy could be missing. You still have x squared, so it's still a quadratic. Even both of these guys could be missing and it's still called a quadratic, okay? But when that first guy's missing, you no longer have an x squared, and so then it's not quadratic. That's why they make this statement here. So when we get to graphing, we're going to notice a couple of things, okay? Um, we know about the shifts and the uh, translations, right? So we know about the vertical stretching and shrinking, and we know about the shifting, right? When you add or subtract a number on the inside, it'll shift it left or right. And if you add or subtract a number outside the basic function, it'll shift it up or down. And then if you multiply the basic function by a number, then it will, um, it will stretch it or shrink it, right? So if we look at this format for quadratic, so normally our functions for quadratics are written like this, okay? Normally they're written like that. But if somehow you could get them to look like this, then you would know that if you have it like that, this is a horizontal shift, meaning it's gonna go left or right. Now, I don't like the way they word it here, so I'm going to reword it. So if it says x minus h, you're going to, um, it's going to move right h units. So once I know what h is, right, if it said x minus 2, I'm going to move right 2 units. If it said x minus 5, I would move to the right 5 units. But if it says x plus h, then that moves the graph to the left, however many units, okay? So if it said x plus 4, then I would be moving 4 units to the left. Now, the number in the front, if it's positive, it might stretch it or shrink it. It might but it will still be a parabola opening upwards. So you see my hand if you're looking at the video. <laughs> I have like a, like a U shape with my hand, okay? So if that A value is positive, it will still keep that same parabola shape that looks like this on the paper, okay? But if it's a negative number, we learned about reflections, right? If it's a negative number, then it'll actually flip it over the X axis, which actually makes it go downward. Okay, so just looking at that number, whether it be in front of the x squared, it is the same a value. Okay, these are the same, the same numbers. Um, if that a value is positive, I know it's going to open upward. And if that a value is negative, then I know it's going to open downward. That's based on our reflections concept in 2.8. And then we know the same thing with this, right? If it's minus a number in there, it's going to the right. And if it's plus the number, it's going to the left, okay? Similarly, if you add or subtract a number on the outside, right? If that number is positive, if they're actually adding K, then it'll go up. And if they're subtracting K, then it'll go down. 
however many units k is, right? So if I'm adding seven, then that means I'm going up seven. If I'm subtracting 10, then that means I move down 10. But k and h are not the same thing as b and c, okay? It takes some work to figure out what h and k are. Um, and, and, and it requires a concept called completing the square that we completely skipped over when we were talking about chapter one concepts, okay? So because we completely skipped over that, I don't expect students to be able to take this and turn it into that using the completing the square technique. So instead, what I've noticed that the book does is instead they use a formula to find H and K. And that's actually on the next page, but um, there is a formula that you actually use. See, completing the square, but we don't do it. When we get to this, I will show you how to figure out the H and the K. So I'll tell you exactly here how to figure out that H and that K value. And we'll definitely get some practice with it, okay? But it's super helpful if you can get this to look like this, okay? Or if you could just pick out the pieces and then you have all the information you need, okay? So it's much easier to graph an equation that looks like this than it is to graph an equation that looks like that, okay? However, we're gonna do both without knowing what H and K are, okay? We're gonna do both just by plotting points, okay? And then we'll talk about the H and the K and then we'll see how that makes things a little bit easier. Okay, so for this problem here, it says for us to graph it by plotting points, so notice that the number in front is a one, right? My A is equal to one, which is positive, right? It's greater than zero, which means the parabola is gonna open upward. So I know that it's going to open upward. So when I start drawing my points, I need to make sure that I have enough points so that you can start to see that it's a parabola shape opening upward. So I'm gonna start off with the basic ones that they always give us, right? They always do negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. And if I need more to like make sure that it's making this like bowl or U shape, I will pick some more X values, okay? But for right now, I wanna actually, I don't know if we've talked about it in this class, I cannot remember the programming of this calculator. So as long as I say, take negative two, and store this button right above the on, store it as X. So I hit store and then X. Don't hit this button too many times because then it changes the letters and you gotta keep going until you get back to X. There you go. Once I do that, I'm just gonna hit enter and it basically saves X as negative two. So then I can type in this whole expression, X to the power two minus four X, minus two. And when I hit enter, it's going to plug in that negative two for X. And so then I get this Y value. Then to do the next one, I'm gonna say negative one store as X and hit enter so that it saves it. And then I don't wanna retype that. So I'm just gonna go up until I highlight it and then hit enter. So it copies it in my input box, right? And if I press enter this time, it's actually gonna plug in the last X value I saved, which is negative one. And so then I get the Y value three. And let me keep repeating this process to plug in zero, one, and two. So zero, store X, saved it, highlight that, enter to copy it, and then enter to actually plug in the zero. Then one, store X, save it, copy my expression, and then hit enter to plug in the one. And then two store X, go copy my expression, and then hit enter to plug in two. I get negative six. So let's see what we get here. Negative two and 10. Negative one and three. 
zero and negative two, one and negative five, two and negative six. So if you look at this, it doesn't look like a bowl. It just looks like, like the left-hand side of this um, parabola, right? If I connect all the dots, it just looks like half of the parabola. Like I don't have the other half yet, okay? So that's gonna tell me to keep putting more numbers on this side. So if I stopped at the X value two, I can plug in some more X values to hopefully get the other side of this parabola. So I'm gonna pick like three, four, and five. And since I already programmed my calculator, it's just three store X and then go plug it in. Then four store X. It just makes the calculator part a lot easier. And then five store X. And we get three. So now I have the point three and negative five. I have the point four and negative two. And then I have the point five and three. And so now you can see the other side of that parabola, right? I tried. <laughs> it looks pretty okay. Um, and so then there we have our parabola. But we definitely need to come up with more points because we weren't seeing the parabola, okay? So this is the one in the form of ax squared plus bx, b being a negative four, and then plus c, where c is actually a negative two, okay? So that's this form up there. We just graphed one by plotting points of that form. Now what we need to do is we need to try one in the other form. So there's an extra problem in here, part B, but we're not gonna do it. I just X'd it out. But we are gonna do part C because part C looks like that other weird one, right? So here it's telling you that A is negative one half. Well, if A is negative one half, then that means that the parabola is actually going downward, right? So when we graph it, we need to make sure that it looks kind of like a hill, okay? Now here, I'm gonna start doing the same thing. I'm gonna do the negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two, and then see if we need more numbers in whichever direction, okay? So this is a different function here. So I'm gonna start with negative two store X, always store your first x value first, and then plug in your expression. So now I'm gonna plug in my expression, negative one half parentheses, x minus four, close the parentheses, square, and then plus three. That's my whole expression. And then I'm gonna hit enter, and it's gonna plug in the negative two I last saved. I get negative 15. Then I'm gonna go through the whole motions, right? Store the next X value, oops, and then go plug it in. I don't like that fraction. I'm gonna use a decimal because I cannot visualize where that fraction goes. <laughs> but if I have the decimal, I, I know where negative nine and a half is, right? So I like to use the decimal versions. Zero store X. Copy, plug in the zero. One store X. Copy, plug in the one. Oh, got a fraction again, so I'm gonna hit double. There we go, I know where that's at. Two store X. And I get one. So let's see what this, this looks like it's one-sided as well, but we'll, we'll see. So negative two and negative 15 is off the chart. So I'm not even gonna graph that one because it's just way off the graph. Negative one and 9.5 is like right in between those two Y values, negative nine and negative 10. 
then zero and negative five is here. Then one and negative 1.5 is between one and two, negative one, negative two. Two and one is here. So again, it looks like half of a parabola going down. It looks like this side of the parabola going down, but I need the other side to go down. So I'm gonna pick some more X values, like three, four, and five. If this is not enough, we'll use more, but we'll see. So three store X, copy, oh, decimal, 2.5. Four store X, copy and plug in, five store X, copy and plug in the five, so we get 2.5. So let's see what we have here. Three and 2.5 is there between two and three. Four and three, five and 2.5. And now you start to see that it's starting to come down the other way, right? So now we can see. If you use symmetry, right? One to the left and one to the right, it went down half a unit, right? And then one to the left and one to the right, it actually goes down two units and then over. So if I go down two units and then over, it's gonna land right there. And then this one was one, two, three in the middle. So one, two, three in the middle, but it will have this symmetry. If you're not sure, you can keep plugging in more and keep getting these other points, okay? Until you start to see that it's going downward. But now we graphed both of them, okay? And notice that the negative made it flip downward. This one half did, did make it um, a little bit wider than the actual normal x squared. The minus four moved it to the right because the vertex is supposed to always be here. Then it goes downward. It got a little wider and then it slid over to the right four, but then it also went up three. And so that's the plus three there. So the question is, is like, how do you turn the AX squared plus BX plus C into something like this, okay? The technique, like I said, is supposed to be what they called completing the square. However, we didn't learn that and we're not going to. And I promise you, I'm saving you a nightmare. It's ridiculous. Um, especially once, if you know there's a formula for it, like it doesn't make any sense to do all that work <laughs> when you could just do some easy computation and already have the answer, okay? Um, so what the vertex formula, the vertex form of the function is that form that we saw earlier where they have a x minus h squared plus k. That is called the vertex form. And the reason why it's called the vertex form is because the vertex is the point h comma k. Notice here it's minus, but here it's not. And here it's positive and here it is. So the h will be this, the opposite sign is what's in there. And the k will be the same sign as what's out here. So a little bit different, okay? And it says it's not, necessary to memorize an expression for k because k is essentially what you get when you plug in h, right? If I were to plug in h, regardless of what this number is, it doesn't matter if it's a 5, 10, 20, whatever. If I plug in the same number for h, when I subtract itself, it's going to be zero. Zero squared is zero. Anything times zero is zero. And so you'll just end up with this number here, okay? So that's all it's saying is that you never have to memorize anything for k, you just figure out what h is and then plug it in and you'll know what k is. So here's the formula for h. 
this is a big one. It's negative B over 2A. And it should look real familiar. You remember your quadratic formula? It's negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. Remember that guy? What happens when this thing is zero? You add and subtract zero, it doesn't make any difference. You still have negative B, right? So that's where that came from, okay? You don't worry about the radical part though. Once you know what H is by using that little formula, then you can figure out K just by plugging H into your function. So what are the characteristics of the graph of a quadratic formula? It is a parabola shape, right? Um, with the vertex, h comma k, and the vertical line, which is x equal to h as the axes. And when it says as axes, another way they say it is axes of symmetry. Because it doesn't matter if the parabola opens upward or if it opens downward. This vertex is where the, the parabola mirrors itself, okay? So if I were to fold this parabola over like a line like that, it would be the same when I fold it over, it would land on top of itself. And the same thing if it were downward, if I folded it along this line, it would be the same on both sides, okay? And I was actually using that fact to come up with those other points in that last graph, right? I already knew that it was symmetric. So I was using the symmetry to find those other points, okay? Now, but that line is whatever this X value is, that's that vertical line. So whenever they ask you for the axes of symmetry, Make sure that you're giving them a whole equation, not just a number, because it's not the x value where the mirroring happens. It's a line that you fold the paper on, right, that gives you that axis of symmetry, okay? So always, always, when they ask you for the axis of symmetry, make sure that you're entering an equation. If it already has the x equals, then it already gave you half of the equation, and you just plug in the h, okay? But if it doesn't give you anything, it's just a big block and it says axis of symmetry, you have to type in X equals and then whatever number you get, okay? Now it opens upward like this when the A value is greater than zero, right? When it's positive. Okay, and it opens downward, which means it'll look like a hill when A is less than zero or when A is negative, okay? That we already discussed. Um, it is actually going to be wider than regular X squared if that number is less than one, like the one half in the last problem, okay? And it will be narrower if the A value is greater than zero. Now notice that it has the absolute value bars because you're not looking at the sign of that number in the front. We don't care what the number is um, or we don't care what the sign is. If it's positive or negative, it just tells you whether it opens up or down. But the actual number tells you whether it's opening wider or narrower, okay? So that's why they put the bars there because they just don't want you to look at the sign of the number. The sign tells you something completely different the number itself tells you wider or narrower. And then your y-intercept is always gonna be zero comma C, right? If you plug in zero here, you're actually gonna end up with this number C. Here, if you plug in zero, you have to do all the computations to figure out that number and you'll realize it is the same thing as C. Now the x-intercepts are found by setting the equation equal to zero. Or if it's in this form, 
you can set that equal to zero. You just use the square root property. Here you'd have to use factoring or the quadratic formula. Now, if you were trying to use the quadratic formula, if what's in the house is a positive number, then you're gonna have two x-intercepts. You're gonna have negative b plus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. And you're gonna have negative b minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. But the y value should be zero because you took the whole function equal to zero. And a function equal to zero is the same as y equal to zero. However, if what's in the radical in the quadratic formula is zero, then all you end up with is the negative b over 2a. And that's it. And if the y value is, or the inside of the radical is negative, then there's no x intercepts. I didn't write that right. Okay, because it would be an imaginary. If you got a negative inside the house, it would be imaginary. And so then you can't graph that. You can't graph the imaginaries. So let's talk about how we can use this now to make that thing look like this. And once I make it look like that, I could tell you what the axis of symmetry is and what the vertex is, okay? I actually wanna do more with this problem because I realized that um, there's not enough in here. So it asks you for the axes and the vertex. So I wrote this over here. But there's problems in your assignment that ask you for more than just the axes of symmetry and the vertex. So it's the same function, 2x squared plus 4x plus 5 that I wrote over here on this other page. Um, but I don't just want the axis of symmetry and the vertex. I also want to know what the domain is. I want to know what the range is. I want to know what the y-intercepts are, what the x-intercepts are. And all that information should help me get the graph. Or I can do the graph first and then figure out all this information. It just depends on how you want to do it. And then the last thing we want is the intervals of increasing, decreasing a constant. We know what parabolas look like. They are not constant ever. So I'm pretty sure we're never going to have this happen because it either looks like that or it looks like that. It's never flat, right? Like a constant, never. So it won't have any constant intervals. But let's look at this one. I'm gonna start from the beginning, okay? So for the axis of symmetry, we know that that's at x equals h, okay? And we know that h is found by the formula negative b over 2a. So we just have to figure out what A is, what B is, and we may even need to know what C is later. So A is a positive two, B is a positive four, and C happens to be a positive five. So when I plug A and B into this formula, you get negative times four over two times two, which is negative four over four, which is negative one. So what is the axis of symmetry? It's x equals, it has to be an equation, negative one. Now I have half of the vertex because I know what h is, right? h equals negative one. I've got half of the vertex. I need the other half, which is the k. And remember, in order to find k, you just do f of h. And since h is negative 1, I'm just plugging negative 1 into my function. Which is 2 minus 4 plus 5, and I get 3. Okay, 
So my K value is three. H was negative one and K was three, which means that my vertex is going to be H comma K. Negative one comma three. They didn't ask me here, but it's something worth mentioning, right? Since A is equal to two and that's positive, it does mean that the parabola is going to open upward, okay? Here's my little vertex, but it is going to open upward when I try to graph it. So I'll wait for domain and range because well, domain's easy. It's going to the left forever and to the right forever. So domain should be negative infinity to infinity, regardless if it opens up or down. But the range is a little bit different. Depending on what this y value is, that's the lowest y value. And then it will go up to infinity. So I know my range is going to be whatever that y value is up to positive infinity because it opens up. The thing is, is what is that y value, right? You're talking about the y value of the vertex. And we know what the y value of the vertex is. It's three. So that means that the range goes as low as the y value three, and then it branches up, up from there going toward infinity. Now the y-intercept we were told was at zero comma c, which in this case, c is five. But if you weren't sure, you could always just plug in zero and you'll get the Y. You'll get that C value, right? So if I were to plug in zero, zero, this is all zero, this is all zero, I get that same five. So if you remember this, great. If you don't, just plug in zero for X and you'll figure out the Y value. And the x-intercepts is the reverse. You plug in zero for the y. So you plug in zero for the y and you gotta try to figure out what x is. So in this case, remember that's fancy way of saying y. So this is like saying zero equals two x squared plus four x plus five. Now, if you can factor it, that's great. But if you cannot factor it, or you too, you just don't want to bother, then you can always use quadratic formula, right? I'm trying to think. I don't think I can factor that. Mm -mm. Five and two is seven, five take away two is three, five times two is 10 plus one. Nope, it's not, it's not gonna factor. So I'm gonna use my quadratic formula. Negative b plus or minus b squared minus four a c all over two a. So let me see, what do I get inside that house? Four squared is 16 minus eight times five which is 40, ooh, I get a negative 24. I don't even need to continue because we know that this is an imaginary, right? And since we got an imaginary, we don't have any x-intercepts. So if you're doing this on the computer, make sure that for that you select like none or DNE, whatever they ask you to type in if there's no x intercepts. But there's none. Okay, no x intercepts here. All because inside that house was a negative, which makes it imaginary. We can't draw imaginary. So if I were to draw my graph, let's put all this information together. I got two points I got my vertex and I got my y intercept. I'd have more points if I had x-intercepts, but I don't. So just two points that I have so far. So negative one and one, two, three is right here. And then the y-intercept, which is zero and five, okay? 
Now this is the vertex, which means, and it's opening upward, right? Because A was positive. So this is the absolute lowest dot on the graph. I can even use the ideas of symmetry. If I go one this way and up five, then I should be able to go one the other way and up five. That's just using symmetry. So my parabola does look something like this. And this one looks narrower than a regular x squared. And it's because I had a number bigger than one in the front. My a was bigger than one. And so lastly, if I'm doing integral intervals of increasing and decreasing, because we know there's no constant here, um, you just have to label it. So this side, if I trace it from left to right, seems like it's decreasing up until this spot, and then it starts to increase from that spot. So if I say decreasing and then increasing. So for the decreasing, it goes all the way to the left because of the arrow. So that's negative infinity. And it keeps decreasing up until you get to here. And that x value is negative 1. And remember, always use parentheses on your increasing and decreasing when you're doing your homework. Then from there, same x value, negative 1, it starts to increase all the way to the right. It's going up more than it is to the right, but it does go to the right forever. So you do have positive infinity. So that's the end of that type of problem where they gave us the function, it was in the ax squared plus bx form, and then we had to work with it and go from there, right? Um, and essentially that gives us everything. Once you have that h and that k, and you remember the concepts about x-intercepts and y-intercepts, you know, setting the opposite one equal to zero, and then finding what you're looking for. So for instance, if I'm trying to find the y-intercept, I make x zero, and then I go find the y. If I'm trying to find an x-intercept, I make y zero, and then go try to find the x. Okay, it's always the opposite when you're finding the intercepts. And anytime you graph anything, those are the first two things that you usually need. And if they're not the first two, they are one of the things that you need to find in order to graph something. You always want to know what the x-intercepts are and what the y-intercepts are, no matter what you're graphing. Okay, so we have those little tricks, I guess, with the zeros to find them. But these are what all the questions, I mean, some questions just ask you this, some questions just ask you that, some of them just ask you for the graph, some of them just ask you for the axes of symmetry and vertex, and then you might get a question that asks you for all of them, and so you have an example on how to find all the different parts. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to talk about these uh, word problems because we do have the models part of this section. Um, and the models, everybody's always afraid of word problems. I know I myself was afraid of word problems um, until somebody broke it down and then it made sense to me. So I'm going to try my best to like break it down so that it can make sense to you. Um, and not just be like, here's the word problem, go at it. <laughs> so um, one thing I noticed in the computer, this example that I got from the notes, it said something about like, give the function that describes what's going on. And, but I, when I looked at your work in your home, in your homework section, they never asked you to find that equation. They always gave you the equation, okay? They always told you what the function was. So I crossed this thing out because we don't need to figure out what it is. They're going to give it to us, okay? So I just gave it to you. Here's the little sentence, and then that's the equation that goes with it, okay? Um, but I am going to do all the other parts because the other parts are going to use that equation, okay, or that function. But before I do that, I need to talk about some stuff, okay? 
So we know that if your A is positive, this parabola will open upward, right? Wherever the vertex is, it'll open upward, okay? It creates this little bottom dot, right? That bottom dot is actually what's called a minimum point, okay? You have an X value where this minimum occurs, and then the Y value is actually the minimum value, okay? So your Y values are your minimum and eventually maximum values. I'll write that down in a second. The other situation you can have is if A is negative, right? And then in that case, the parabola goes downward like this, and the vertex is actually at the top now, making it a maximum, okay? So when you're talking about this, the min or the max, whichever, they occur at the vertex which is the same as h comma k, right? So if you ever hear a word problem or read a word problem or hear it, whatever, see it? Um, remember, as soon as they start asking you for minimum and maximum values of a quadratic, they're automatically talking about that vertex, okay? And so you will have to do the negative b over 2a formula. You just have to find out what they want about that maximum or minimum. Do they want the X value of the maximum or minimum? Or do they want the Y value of the maximum or minimum? Okay, or do they want both? Okay, so you definitely have to pay attention to the wording to know which one of those three they want. Just the X, just the Y, or just the H, or just the K, or the whole point, both of them, okay? So here's where we have to get a little bit weird with the vocabulary. Okay, H is the X value where the max or the min occurs. Okay, so it's where the maximum minimum occurs and it's an X value. The K is the Y value or min slash max value. So if they ever say, find the minimum value, then they want the Y value. So you have to do the negative B over 2K to figure out what H is, but then you have to go plug that answer into the function to figure out what the Y value is, okay? So we'll see some. I think I have like three different word problems to help um, when you go work on your homework, okay? So the first is having to do with projectiles, okay? So you have, basically, it says a ball is directly upward, projected directly upward at from an initial height of 100 feet. So for me, I imagine I'm on top of a building. This building is 100 feet, right? Maybe it's like 90 something and you consider my height, right? <laughs> but whatever, you've got the ball. And the ball is gonna get thrown upward, but when it gets thrown upward, as you go through time, um, where the ball ends up, is it actually through time, it goes up, 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 but then at some point it's gonna go down, 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 down until it hits the ground, right? And if you notice, this is a parabola. I just didn't draw the other half of it because the ball started here, okay? And notice something else, this parabola is actually downward, isn't it? And it has to do with the fact that that's negative. And that negative has to do with gravity. We won't go there, this is not physics, but it does have to do with gravity. That's why it's negative, okay? And it even has a certain speed. I can, don't know, I don't know how fast 80 feet per second is. My brain doesn't work like that. A miles per hour, yes, and feet per second, no. <laughs> but it's going at 80 feet per second. So that's like how hard I threw it to begin with, okay? Um, and then, of course, where the ball started has to do with your height. So this is the whole function to figure out my height, depending at what time. Okay, so if you imagine like an x-axis over here, this is at time zero, when t is equal to zero. I don't know the time when it reaches its maximum, and I definitely don't know the time when the ball touches the ground. Okay, 
those two pieces of information I do not have yet, although I do have enough information to find them, okay? And I'm pretty sure they're going to um, talk about it in a minute. So if I imagine my y-axis, since this is zero, if I imagine my y-axis here, okay, this spot right here where I threw the ball is 100. That's the y value there because it got thrown from 100 feet, right? So I imagine 160 is probably somewhere above it. Probably not all the way up there, but probably somewhere above it, okay? And I'm mentioning that because I saw this, but we'll talk about it in a minute. So it's not really A, I mean B, it's actually part A because we didn't do part A. So the first question that they ask is, after how many seconds does the projectile reach its maximum height? And so here's where you really have to dissect your variables and what they represent. T in this case represents time. And since they're using seconds here, this means it's going to be in seconds. It shouldn't be equals. It's just in seconds, time in seconds. H of T, the Y value, is the height. And since they used feet there, it's in feet. Okay, so we have to be able to dissect the X value, which is not X, it's T in this case, and then the Y value, which is the, the function notation, right? So in this case, the Y value is H of T. So they'll change the variables on you all the time, so you really, really have to dissect that, okay? That's probably the hardest part, is just figuring out which one's acting like X and which one's acting like Y, and what are the measurements, okay? Because the units will matter. You can't be saying this is $5 when actually it's five people, right? It just doesn't make sense. So you have to know what the units are. And it helps you if you know the units because then it tells you exactly which number you're looking for. So notice this question says, how many seconds does the projectile reach its maximum height? Well, I know that T is in seconds. So then they're asking me to find that T value or that X value or that H value. They all the same, okay? So if I wanna know what that T value is, I need to do the negative B over 2A. Now, B is this positive 80. A is the number in front of T squared, which is negative 16. So I get negative 80 over negative 32, don't know what that is. Negative 80 over negative 32. I need decimals, 2.5, great. So then that's going to be 2.5 seconds. Then the next question says, what is this maximum height? So now they're asking me for H of T. And we know how to find the Y values, right? This is a Y value. We know how to find the Y values. You just plug in whatever you just found into your function. Well, not F, it's not called F here, it's called H, right? So let's see, negative 16 times 2.5 squared plus 80 times 2.5 plus 100. I have no idea what that is. Give me a second. I'm going to plug it in my calculator. And I get, oh wow, 200. And we know that the height is in feet, right? So this would be 200 feet. So we have our first pair of answers for the first questions. This one did ask us for both. Not all the questions will ask for both, and we'll see that in a little bit, okay? Um, now let's see what the second one says. This one says, for what intervals of time? 
is the height of the ball greater than 60 feet? Okay, so it says, for what intervals of time is the height greater than 160 feet? So I know I'm here. They're basically saying if I were to look at 160, right? And if I were to draw the line there, what are these X values? This X value here and this X value here. What are those times? This whole little interval, I am above 160, right? What is that interval? What T value does that start? And what T value does that end when I'm above 160? And it said greater than, not greater than or equal to, okay? So the funny thing about it is, is that you do have to set it equal to, but then you won't include them later. And I'll explain. So I'm actually going to take my height. I need to know when the height is greater than 160. Okay, so then that means that I need to take my height function. And set it greater than 160. And then we've solved inequalities before. So we just have to subtract the 160 over to the other side. And then we get negative 16t squared plus 80t, and that would turn into minus 60, okay? And when we were doing the inequalities, okay, what we had to do was we had to change it to an equal sign instead of a greater than sign. And then we had to create a number line and test all the little intervals and all that good stuff, okay? So what we're gonna do here is we're just basically gonna find when all of this equals zero to find those numbers, okay? So let's see what we get when we do that. I'm gonna use the quadratic formula because that's the easiest way to do it. So negative B plus or minus B squared minus four times A times C all over two times A. So this becomes negative 80, I'll see what goes in there, over negative 32. So let me see, parentheses, 80 squared minus four times negative 16 times negative 60. I actually get this number. So I'm gonna do two different problems. I'm gonna do negative 80 plus this radical. And then I'm gonna do negative 80 minus this radical. And I forgot my two. So let's see, fraction negative 80 plus square root of two, five, six, zero. And at the bottom, negative 32 and I get this decimal 0 0.91 it doesn't tell me how far to round it's usually three decimal places so I'll do eight one that eight's going to make this eight a nine okay then let's see the other one I'm not going to redo the whole thing I'm just going to change the plus to a minus go to the front and then change that to a subtract. And I get 4.081. This one will not change that one, right? So we'll keep it like that. And so those are the X values, right? You have one X value here that's apparently 0 0.9 or something close to that, right? And then you have another X value where it's close to 4.1 pretty close to 4.1. That's where this is happening and this is happening and it's above 160. The thing is, is that it said greater than, right? Not equal to. So when you write these numbers in an interval, 
It's just greater than just this symbol, which means use parentheses. Only when it says greater than or equal, it had a bar and then you would use brackets, okay? So my interval will be this left X value. What's the actual number? One nine. And then this X value, 4.081, okay? And that's the interval that they were asking you for. So that was a little weird. That was a little tricky. I think it's the hardest one. Normally you don't get asked this, but you might have one problem in your homework that does. So I wanted you to have an example. The other common question we'll get is, after how many seconds did the ball hit the ground? So now you're trying to figure out what this value is. Okay, so you wanna know how much time it passed before the ball actually touched the ground again. Well, not again, completely. So in that case, where you're trying to find this something about this point you want to know the t value about this point but you already know the y value the y value of this point is zero okay which means if i want to find the t value all i have to do is set my y value equal to zero and solve for t now i do have an expression for this y value it's this one Oh, not 60, it's, what is it, plus 100, right? Negative 16t squared plus 80t plus 100. So I'm taking my height function and I'm setting it equal to zero. It's the same process as this one, except my c value is not negative 60 anymore. My c value is 100, but the process is exactly the same. So I'm gonna say t equals negative b plus or minus b squared minus four times a times c all over two times a. So I'm gonna get something in that house over negative 32. So let me see, clear 80 squared minus four parentheses, negative 16 parentheses, 100. Oops, not that button. There we go. Oh, this is a big number. It's okay. So that's gonna be two different numbers, right? Negative 80 plus this value over negative 82, 32, and then negative 80 minus square root of this value over negative 32. And let's see what those two numbers are. So fraction, negative 80 plus square root 12800 0, 0, over negative 32. At three decimal places, that five is gonna change this five to a six. And then now we do it again, but with a minus instead of a plus. and I hit enter and I get 6.03. That five will change this five to a six. And so now I have two, two T values, right? I'm trying to get my whole picture in there, but <laughs> I don't have the whole thing. Let me see if I can zoom out a little. Okay, maybe that'll help. So I found two T values, but there's only one answer, okay? Because notice that at time zero is when I actually threw the ball, right? There's no negative time over here, no negative one point something. But it's just letting you know that if this parabola were to continue, it would be at the value negative one point something for the T or the X axis, okay? But that's actually not the one that we need because one, there's no such thing as negative time, right? So if you talk about the other one, well, here at four seconds, it hit 160 feet. If it keeps going, it makes sense that around six seconds, it would touch the ground, okay? Two seconds later, it would touch the ground. So this one is the only one that makes sense, right? There's no such thing as negative time. So your answer will be T equal to 6.036.
which is in seconds, right? T is in seconds. So it takes about six seconds for this ball to go from the 100 feet tall, I throw it up, and by the time it goes to the ground, it's taken about six seconds. Now, you will have a problem very similar to this one, and I'm not gonna have enough time for the last two um, word problems. So we'll cover those word problems in the next class. Um, and then I'll push back the deadline because it can't be due tomorrow or whatnot if you don't even have examples for the last two word problems, okay? So I'll push the deadline back. And when we come in the next class, I'll start off with those two word problems and then we'll go into the next section, okay? But I just wanted to make one point real quick that you will be asked a similar question like this, except your function will actually look like this. Okay, if it looks something like that, make sure that you rewrite it so that the x squared, which is actually a negative, is in the front. Oh, and I forgot there should be an x here. You have to have your x squared in front, then your x's. And that's a positive 17, so it would be plus 17x. You have to have it in that descending order, squares, then x's, then constants in order for you to pick out the A, the B, and the C, okay? So in this case, if you saw something like this, rearrange it, right, the correct way, and then you can say A is negative one, B is a positive 17, and then C is missing, right? So it's zero, okay? I just wanted you to be aware of that before you go try to do some of those problems, okay? We have two, two word problems, but it's going to take me more than a minute, <laughs> maybe about five minutes to cover them, but definitely more than a minute. So I'm not going <laughs> to do those two problems right now, but we'll definitely do them in the next class. Okay. If you have any questions for me, please hang back. If you start working on this assignment and you have questions as you go, just text them to me and I can help you walk through them. Um, even if you just want to get the assignment done out of the way before the weekend and you get to the other two word problems, you can ask me questions about those two. Okay. Um, but if you don't have other questions for me right now, you guys are free to go. I hope you have a good weekend. Um, try to start <laughs> 3.1, but if you don't get to finish it, I totally understand because we haven't done the word problems yet. But you guys have a good one.